exciting. Uh, it's good to be here, and thanks everyone for coming out on a night when it's raining cats and dogs and pterodactyls and everything else out there. Um, and thank you, Gopika, for, for starting out the, uh, the conversation with a focus on justice, and I'm going to continue in that vein, because I think that's actually where our movement needs to focus going forward. Um, and I'm going to be speaking in tonight about how reproductive justice intersects with or interacts with or is affected by a couple of other issues. And I'm doing this because, as Gopika said, um, these all the critical issues of our time are linked. And so bearing those linkages in mind, I think, will make us stronger. Um, and the first linkage I want to talk about is perhaps uh, not the most intuitive one, but it's it's a link with climate change. Um, neither reproductive justice nor climate change is a box office favorite in the current political climate, um, and I can't imagine that in the upcoming four years either of them will become more so. Uh, but both issues mobilize passionate activists and they both speak to the core of our humanity. Um, and I bring this up because when we talk about reproduction and climate change together, the conversation has historically been really limited, um, and usually it's emerged in conversations about population. And what that has frequently looked like is in the context of finger pointing at women, usually poor women, often women of color, for exercising their human right to bear children. Um, so I work, as Craig said, with an organization called Conceivable Future, and, and in the course of that work, I can't tell you how many times we've been approached by people advocating population control policies, um, which I find to be pretty brutal. Um, they make, they make this their main issue, they call it population stabilization, population control, and they're almost always comprised of middle class, well-educated, frequently white people um, working to curtail other people's fertility and blaming them for much larger problems. If you want a good example, you can look up Californians for population stabilization, um, your daily dose of barf, if you will. Um, and so I bring this up because I want to draw attention to the harmful comment and false argument that many Western people join the population conversation in order to point fingers at developing countries, at low-income groups whose populations are growing, rather than in Western companies, excuse me, countries and middle-class groups where populations are stable. Population corresponds to climate harm only to the degree that individuals consume resources, right? Nobody emits more, res more carbon, nobody, nobody de does more environmental damage than the United States. And if everyone on Earth consumed the way that we do, we would need an extra four and a half to six Earths worth of stuff to sustain ourselves, right? So um, I, I, I want to remind us um, that the use of the topic of population to scapegoat the poor or another country's citizens um, is a fraught issue with a lot of history there. Um, and I feel that reproductive justice, it sort of turns the idea of reproductive choice and sovereignty into a cudgel that blames the most vulnerable people instead of the most powerful. Um, this attitude is not something on the fringe. Uh, Climate and reproduction are almost always linked in this way, um, and I believe it's wrong-headed to sort of address climate change, excuse me, um, the wrong-headed att attempts to sort of address climate change that curtail reproductive liberties of people of people are troublesome. Um, it's an important link, but it's also not the only link between climate and reproductive justice. Um, climate change is also often framed as for the children or for future generations, so activism that takes place in the names of generations to come. Um, a lot of groups organize around parent identities, right? Mothers out front, climate mama, etc. They do really excellent and effective climate work, um, and there is some sort of synergy with the identity of parent there. But in, we have found in, in our lives as climate organizers and as reproductive justice organizers um, that the very idea of bearing the next generation grows more difficult to resolve the more that we know about the climate crisis and about other issues of the time. So for me, one of the reasons that climate and reproductive justice are so profoundly linked is this question of how you decide to have a baby when opportunities for, leading, for it leading a healthy and productive life are increasingly curtailed. And this sort of gets to what Gopika is talking about about nobody makes decisions freely in the face of so much um, injustice. So the decision of whether or not to have children and how to parent is really dramatically shaped by an unequal world. So coming of age in the climate crisis, as I did, um, means that our reproductive choices and opportunities are already curtailed by the fact that the earth is warming and people are getting meaner and storms are more frequent, <laughs> the policies are more unjust, right? Um, young people's access um, across the country are already expressing hesitation at the thought of having children in a world that looks like this. That is reproductive justice, or injustice, as the case may be. Um, and there are synergies with a lot of other movements. Um, about six months ago, in the wake of the murders of Philando Castile and Al Alton Sterling, two women published essays. They're both on medium.com if you want to look them up. Uh, Bridget Todd and Sabrina Joyce Stevens. They are both African-American women, and they both wrote essays about how it feels futile to have 
a child in an era of state violence. Um, and when we talk about state-sponsored harm that threatens life, Black Lives Matter and climate justice activists have common cause here. The point is that even though we have access to more family planning capacity than nearly any point in human history, nobody makes reproductive choices in this day and age freely in the face of so many dangers. Um, and as the climate changes, all these stakes are raised. We don't need to look overseas or to a distant future to see life-threatening environmental impacts that are intensified by climate factors, superstorms, droughts, etc. Um, but these increasing disruptions to ordinary life threaten access for the vulnerable and those people who need support, right? So infants and children, the pregnant, the elderly, people with disabilities, people escaping domestic abuse, they depend on caregivers and on systems of support that are already overstretched, right? They threaten to become more so. And in emergency, these networks are frequently conscripted for the general population, right? And at the same time, states of emergency create more opportunities for harmful civil, um, for human and civil rights to be curtailed. Zika virus is a good example, right? There are maps of it's coming into Texas, it's coming into Florida, and meanwhile you have conservative administrations in Texas cutting down on access to abortion, access to birth control, access to reproductive health care, and that leaves people in a real bind. Um, so as the threats get higher, your access to self-care and to reproductive care gets lower. Those are the kinds of things that I, that I look at and I worry about, right? Climate impacts every social issue. It's going to test every community. It's going to test all of our versions of justice. Um, allyship can't be a theoretical idea as the problem deepens, right? To truly address these challenges, I think we need to build a bridge between movements with a historically poor record of working together. So I think environmentalists need to get right on reproductive justice issues, right? No more scapegoating mothers and mothers-to-be for climate crimes of big business um, and our leaders. An end to Big Green, and by which I mean Sierra Club, of which I'm a member, right? Support for these coercive use of birth control and incentivized sterilization programs in poor communities, not okay. No more scaremongering about population bonds in the face of a much more combustible threat. And the reproductive justice movement needs to foreground real climate solutions before the climate crisis further undermines the reproductive freedoms that we fought so hard to attain. So I spent a couple minutes on climate because I'm a climate person and that's one of the things that I care about, right? But it's not the only thing that's, that's related to and amplified by, by this, what's at stake with reproductive justice. There are innumerable ways in which these systems depend on each other. So the other one I want to talk about briefly is economics, socioeconomic status, and specifically poverty. Um, most of us in here know that reproductive health care is expensive, um, and when reproductive autonomy is curtailed, it nearly always hits poor women the hardest. This is also a point that Gopika made. Having a uterus is expensive to the point that there's a hashtag called the woman tax to you know, describe, describe the expenses incurred by having a uterus. Um, women, by some accounts, spend up to $11,000 through the course of their lifetime just on menstrual supplies, um, which on top of a pay gap starts to look quite substantial when you add it all up. Um, and if you think hygiene products are expensive, let's talk about birth control. Uh, for someone without health insurance, uh, given how many threats we've heard from the Trump administration about appealing Obamacare, that may be a rather large category of people in the next couple of years. Birth control pills can cost up to $50 a month, that's $600 a year, um, which is real money. It doesn't end there. So cash or self-pay for first trimester surgical abortion fees generally range from three thousand, excuse me, three hundred to twelve hundred dollars. It can go up to the three thousand range. Um, that's a lot of money, especially if you happen to be making minimum wage, which in Rhode Island comes to about eighteen thousand four hundred dollars a year before taxes. Um, mammograms cost over a hundred dollars if you're paying out of pocket, um, and it's a much more burdensome procedure as we're seeing for somebody in a lower income bracket. Uh, then there's the question of access. If you live in Rhode Island, and if you have a car, um, transportation to reproductive health care may be relatively easy. We're a small state, Planned Parenthood's right down the road. Um, but if you live in Texas, right, and you don't have a car, you're facing much greater barriers to health care. You're the closest clinic is six hours away. Who's going to look after your kids? How will you get there? How will you get home? What are you going to tell your job? Um, and these class and these socioeconomic effects are racialized, uh, by which I mean that race and class often overlap in the United States. And so what affects poor women is also apt to dis disproportionately affect women of color. So, for instance, Latinas have one of the highest poverty rates of women in the workforce. It's 12.1% um, as of about a year ago. In large part, that's due to working low-wage jobs. Um, the jobs are hourly, where workers aren't paid for time off. They're not aff afforded health care visits. Um, and for a community where a few years ago um, Latinas earn on average about half of what white men make, additional costs in health care 
um, automatically become really, really burdensome, right? So cutting funding to organizations like Planned Parenthood, government subsidized, subsidized health care programs that provide these really critical reproductive services hit communities of color, immigrant communities, uh, impoverished communities, um, and it inherently targets them, it targets them in an unjust or disproportionate way, right? Um, and it also directly impacts women's ability to remain in the workforce. So, for instance, women who can determine the number and spacing of their children, right, who have, who have access to reproductive health care that permits them to decide when they want to be, become pregnant and if they want to become pregnant, generally have better access to education and employment without all these unanticipated costs um, or the stress of an unplanned pregnancy. And restrictions on access to birth control directly impact women's financial well-being and their economic security of both themselves and of their families. Um, and regardless of whether a pregnancy is planned or not, it still affects woman's ability to secure a job or remain at her place of work. I am an academic, which is a place that, you know, despite all these legal protections for people who are pregnant, we have a really, really bad track record of being really bad to, to pregnant women on the tenure track. Um, women of color and low-wage job workers are more likely to hold jobs where pregnancy discrimination is pervasive and it goes unpunished. Um, it affects their ability to continue earning income at a critical point in their lives. Um, so there's a whole bunch of bad news, and I'm certain that I don't need to convince anyone in this room about the need to fiercely protect the gains that we've made in the past 50 to 60 years. Um, but I will reiterate that such terrifying transitions nationally mean that the stakes are so much higher locally, right? It ups the game for municipal governments, it ups the game for state governments, state protections, and state policies. Um, here in Rhode Island, we have a responsibility to protect and support other Rhode Islanders. The federal government has made it clear they're not going to do that for us, right? So the responsibility falls on us. We need to reimagine what reproductive justice means in the face of these changes and consider how it's linked to a host of other changes that society faces right now. Reproductive justice matters because black lives matter. Climate action matters because we hold all genders to be equally precious. Economic justice matters because reproductive rights are human rights and a knowledge of history demands that justice. And every step of our transition must follow this path towards a more equal and a more just world. Thank you.